Welcome to this webinar on what do students prefer, students' perceptions and preferences when selecting accommodations. That this is a topic that we've really found to be a really super important one because often students' preferences, their ideas, they have a better idea about what works than anyone else. Um, now, um, going back to that previous slide, we can just leave this here, but there okay. was a picture of a report on there. And much of what will be presented today came out of that report, or at least that became, was sort of the beginnings, the background of what we're gonna be talking about today. And, and you may just wanna take a, a look at that. Um, I just put um, the link um, in the chat so you can get that there if you, you want to look at that a little more. Um, but let me tell you just a bit, and I'm actually going to do a, a video about NCO. I think many of you are very familiar with NCO, but, but some of you may be a little less familiar. And I could talk of, all about NCEO, but but we have this welcoming video that I think describes things a, a little bit better than what I typically do on the fly. So um, we're gonna play that next. Um, Virginia? Welcome to the National Center on Educational Outcomes, NCEO. Hi, I'm Cheryl Lazarus, and I'm the director of the center. NCEO focuses on the inclusion of students with disabilities, English learners, and English learners with disabilities in instruction and assessment. First funded in 1990, NCEO leads the way in advocating for appropriate testing, access, and accommodations for all students. Assessment is all about instruction. Assessment is a window for viewing instructional issues and needs. It is also a warning flag that lets us know when something needs to change in instruction. Curriculum, instruction, and assessment are three pillars that need to be in place for improved student outcomes. And NCEO is here to help. NCEO serves a number of audiences. Our primary audience is State Departments of Education, including Special Education, Assessment, English Language Development, Accountability, and Curriculum Offices, in all 50 states and in the unique entities that receive U.S. Special Education funds. In addition, NCEO and its related projects provide technical assistance and information for policymakers, school leaders, educators, and parents and families. NCEO addresses accessibility issues on all tests across the comprehensive assessment system. These assessments range from the formative assessment practices and classroom-based assessments that teachers use to make minute-by-minute -minute and day-by-day -day instructional decisions, to the interim assessments used to measure progress and potential learning loss, as well as summative tests that are often used for accountability purposes. NCEO also works to ensure that assessment results for students with disabilities, English learners, and English learners with disabilities are reported just as they are for other students, and that the results influence accountability systems in the same way as they do other students. NCEO provides a wide range of resources on interim and diagnostics assessments, alternate assessments, accessibility and accommodations, reporting, and much more. It also develops professional development materials that states can share with their districts and schools. NCEO provides targeted and intensive technical assistance to states and entities on numerous topics about the inclusion of students with disabilities in comprehensive assessment systems. For more information, please visit NCEO online at www.nceo.info. It's always kind of fun to see the, see the video. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Andrew Hinkle, now to introduce you to the NCO team that is doing this webinar today. Andrew? 
Uh, hello, everyone. I just wanted to introduce myself and say thank you for being here. We are very excited to have this opportunity to share this information and the previous opportunities we've had to share this with some other groups. It was just so well received, we thought we wanted to get it out to even a larger audience. So thank you for being here. Uh, I am the Education Program Manager for the National Center on Education Outcomes, as well as the uh, tech, uh, um, Technical Assistance uh, lead. Uh, I'd like to give an opportunity to the rest of our team to introduce themselves, and I guess I'll go left to right. So, Cassinda, you will be first. Hi, I'm Cassinda Fleming. I'm a research associate with NCEO, and I um, work on our technical assistance side. Thanks. Thank you. And we started with Virginia. Um, yeah, I, I didn't introduce myself before. I'm Virginia Ressa, and I'm one of the researchers here at NCEO, and we're glad to have everybody join us today. Chris. My name is Chris Rogers with NCEO. Welcome, everyone. And Mari. I'm Mari Kwanbeck. Um, I'm an education program at NCEO. All right, thank you. That's our team today. So um, there, we have numerous goals today, uh, primarily, or to start off, is to share research findings. This isn't something we made up. This is all based on findings that we found in our research or in the research on the perceptions the students have about the accommodations they use. Um, and we would like for you to, at the end of this, recognize the importance of considering student perceptions and perform and preferences when it comes to accommodations. Um, and this leads to, uh, once you understand the importance, to be able to, just, we'll have an opportunity to discuss the key considerations around collecting accommodation preferences, since they are important, for specific diverse learner groups. And if you're going to do that, then we will discuss, since we, will, we want you to do that, we will discuss strategies and considerations for talking about accommodations with students. Um, and we'll have a grand old time doing it. So we, to clarify some terminology, um, I know that we have, a, we have a pretty broad audience today. I saw folks registered from state education agencies, from parent centers, from local school districts. So, um, just to make sure that we're clear about terminology, um, I know that IDEA and ESA or SEA both use terms like universal features, designated features, accommodations. So we tend to think of in the schools of accommodations having kind of three levels. Um, in the research literature in academia and the research literature that we looked at to complete this, this brief that we're sharing with you, uh, they, that distinction just really isn't made. Researchers were look mainly just at accommodations and haven't really made that designation between those three levels. Um, in, that hasn't turned up in the research as of yet. So when we say accommodations, some of those are gonna be universal features like a calculator or a highlighter maybe in your state. Um, and what may be a universal feature in your state may not be one in another. So we're just going to use kind of a blanket term accommodations to cover all of those, all of those things. Um, I hope that um, clarifies things. And then just a quick background on some legislation. And again, I know we've got a diverse audience, so some of you are going to hear some things that you've already heard, but. Um, and if we go too fast for others, please ask questions in the chat box. We'll keep an eye on that as we go along. Um, but the Individuals with Disabilities Act and the Every Student Succeeds Act, both are federal legislation that tell us that students with disabilities are um, required to be given access to the general curriculum um, to part and to participate in state and district-wide testing. Further, IDEA, um, discusses the use of appropriate accommodations and alternate assessments if necessary. So we know that federal legislation is telling schools that they need to include 
students with disabilities in general education curriculum, grade level curriculum. Um, they need to have access through accommodations to all of the assessments that all students have access to. Um, I feel like I skipped. Okay, so how do accommodations help students with disabilities? Um, they're accom and accommodations are designed to remove barriers so that students can show what they know and can do um, in the best way that they can. Um, when we talk about instructional accommodations, we're talking about accommodations that help students meet grade level curriculum. So that ensures that we're providing students with the free and appropriate public education that they're guaranteed um, through law to have access to. Uh, when it comes to assessment accommodations, we're talking about making sure that students can access the assessments that show what they know and can do and making sure that they're part of the statewide and district-wide data that policymakers are using to make decisions. So having students involved in our assessment system, we know that, that that's got multiple um, different positive outcomes and benefits. Um, important thing to remember is that assessment accommodations are changes in the materials or procedures. They're not changes in the validity of assessment. They don't change the difficulty of the assessment for the student. It's allowing them access to the assessment. So that was like a really quick, um, big assessment class in just about two minutes. So I hope everybody's still with us. Um, this is the brief that Cheryl was referring to. And if you use your, you can use your um, camera phone to access it via the QR code or Chris just put it in the uh, in the chat for you. So you've got a direct link there. And if you download this, um, you can kind of follow along on uh, some of the content and um, you'll be able to look at the table I'm gonna show you in a few minutes much more clearly from there. So in order to create this brief, we started from uh, the NCEO Accommodations Toolkit and I wish I could see everybody. I want to say, show of hands, who's used the accommodations toolkit? Um, I hope folks have checked it out. And I am, um, if Chris is on top of things, he's probably going to give you a link to the toolkit in the, um, there it is, in the chat. All right. So we have some people who've checked it out. So the accommodations toolkit, this is a, a great resource because it takes like 20 years of research on accommodations and boils it down into some fact sheets on the research and then some summaries of policy. So you can go and download a fact sheet about um, assistive technology or highlighter or calculator. And what we've done is we've taken the longitudinal data and put it all into a, um, uh, an easier to read format. And part of that for each accommodation, we found that authors were discussing student perceptions and preferences about assessment accommodations. And um, we kind of rose to, to the top and it turned into its own brief. So we started from the accommodations toolkit and we put together this brief that gives you some of, share some of the negative and positive research findings about different accommodations. Um, what we found, two big, two big takeaways. Um, there are some consequences of not considering student perceptions in the in their decision-making process. So by not including students, you're missing information about what they need. Um, and the on the positive side, we saw a lot of research that showed the positive impact of involving students in that decision-making process. And we're gonna talk a little bit about self-esteem, self-determination, self-advocacy. All of those things are a, a great positive side effect of involving students in, in this process. So in that brief, 
we took the a lot of the findings and organized them into a handy dandy table. Um, so this is a quick reference. You can see on the left hand side of the table the different accommodations for which we found some research on student perceptions. Unfortunately, there wasn't research on every accommodation that on student perceptions of every accommodation that's out there. And you'll see that some of the accommodations were studied more often than others. And there was limited data on some of these. But I think that um, that also illuminates the need for further research on some of our work with students dis with disabilities and accommodations. So this, this table is in the brief. And I'll just pause a second before we keep going to see if anybody has any questions. Um, I don't see anything in the chat just yet. So some of the findings, student perceptions, positive findings. Uh, we actually, we saw that students have a positive perception of accommodations. So the good news is that students aren't seeing accommodations as negative and problematic, that they're understanding that this is positive and this is helpful for them. Um, we found that um, asking students about their preferences and perceptions and involving them can build their self-determination skills. And those lead to strong transition skills, self-advocacy. There's a, a lot of literature on self-determination in students with disabilities. And this is one of the ways, and I think a pretty straightforward way to build those advocacy skills, teach students to talk about their learning, et cetera. Um, and if you <laughs> include students in the IEP or decision-making discussions, um, you're gonna have access to more information. Students, um, they're, the, um, they're their experts on themselves, right? They know how they learn best. They know how they express themselves best. And if we give them the opportunity to do that, um, they can share some critical information with us. And um, I always feel like I have a couple of stories in my teaching career that were times when I didn't listen to the kids and I probably should have. So uh, I'm sure other teachers do too. So kids, students come with critical information that we miss if we don't just ask them. Um, so some of the researchers noted some positive things that students said when discussing and talking about their accommodations things like I, I felt less, less frustrated, um, it's easier to solve the equations using the program. Um, it was helpful to me when I heard the characters speak. So for a struggling reader, having uh, the story read aloud can be helpful. Um, I prefer to take my test with accommodations so no one gets me in trouble and there are no distractions. That's a student who probably has a separate setting for their accommodation, right? and other kids can distract you. Um, and so if students are understanding these things, then they don't see being in a different room as a punishment. They realize that it's, it's helpful. It's me helping them to do, do better, to show what they know and can do on their assessment in a setting that's more appropriate. Um, and the last, the last one here is similar to that one. I like it because I can focus on the test and there are not a lot of distractions. Um, so those were the positive perceptions. You can guess, right, that there are some negative ones too. So students, and I could see this one, students felt, some students felt that being removed from the regular classroom was a, um, was making them stand out, was making them feel like an other, an outsider that for some reason they had to go to a different place than their classmates. And their classmates would see them leave the room. So there's a social stigma to that. If uh, you knew, And those are things that sometimes as adults we miss because we're not as aware of um, the, the middle school discussions and, um, you know, kind of prejudices and biases that kids build up. So there can be a social stigma from having to use um, having to use an accommodation, especially if they're materials that are big or bulky, um, some assistive technology devices might make a student feel like they stand out. Um, and related to assistive technology, students reported that 
they often didn't have much input into what technologies they were using, how they were using them. Uh, and I know there's another bullet later on that talks about how students felt like they didn't get enough, enough training, enough practice with their assistive technology devices. Uh, so some of the negative perceptions that researchers recorded, things like kids saying, are we different? Um, are the other kids smarter than us? Am I dumb? No. The character speaking to me was a distraction. So for that student, having the read aloud was maybe a distraction rather than a help. So the same accommodation, we have saw this in a couple of different places, the same accommodation can be seen differently by different students, like being removed from the room. I have a nephew, he loves that he gets to go to the library to take his assessments. But then we know there are other students who if you take them out of the classroom, um, they feel ostracized and isolated and separated. So this is a big reason why um, we don't wanna make assumptions about how kids are, are experiencing their accommodations. Um, and then the last one, test accommodations make me feel bad. Everyone should be treated the same. Um, I could see, see kids, students saying that, right? So then how do you um, have a conversation with them about why, why accommodations, what the positives might be. But knowing what their perceptions are, if we don't ask, we don't know. So um, that's kind of the big obvious takeaway for me from a lot of this research was, um, you don't know if you don't ask the students and if you don't involve them. It should be a, an obvious one, but it's not always. As adults, we miss that all the time. When you look at the brief, you'll see that we go into depth on a couple of um, different uh, technologies and, and accommodations. Here's So we're just going to highlight three of them so that we don't spend the whole time on this piece. But um, some things that we found about assistive technology, as I mentioned, students reported that they oftentimes had little or no input. Uh, and that they wanted more support to be able to use their AT um, properly. Uh, so those are two things that I think point to um, what adults could be doing better, right? Um, is involving our students in the decision-making process and making sure they're well-versed in how to use them. And if you keep tracing that back, well, maybe why weren't they given the support they needed? Maybe the teachers don't have the support they need. And you can kind of trace, keep tracing that back to the point where somebody needs more training and we all need to be more prepared so that we can support students in their use of, of assistive technologies. So um, making sure that our, our adults and our, our educators, our paraprofessionals, um, are all versed in how to use the, the different technologies. Manipulatives, this one was interesting. We found in math that um, students, some students prefer, preferred virtual manipulatives, some students preferred tactile concrete manipulatives, um, and actually uh, students tended to perform better with the physical manipulatives. Uh, so, it, this one is, uh, there's, there's not a good conclusive answer here with manipulatives other than um, talking to the students and finding out which they prefer. Uh, rather than doing whatever's easiest for the adults, which might be the virtual manipulatives, right? It's on the screen, it's there, let them use it. Um, but if they had that tactile pieces of whatever it was to sort and move and use in their, um, in their hands, that might be um, actually have better results in the long run. Um, all right, and then the last one we wanted to talk about is magnification. And this one, I think we pulled out because um, there were some mixed findings here. And this is an area where I think some more research is probably needed, but that students, the first part of the sentence is an obvious one. Students with visual impairments commonly refer, preferred magnification over nothing. Okay, so we got, they want something. Um, but when it came to looking at magnification or large print, 
Students were really mixed. That was generally a, a preference issue. So um, handing students something that magnifies um, or handing them a piece of paper with large print um, is gonna make a difference to that student depending on what their preference is. And uh, apparently um, high magnification can cause eye strain. I wouldn't have known that, but again, um, we're with asking the, the students. With the and, research showing that the eye strain with the high magnification, knowing that the IEP teams could also consider what type of breaks um, that a student might need to um, help with that eye strain. Right, and, um, and we didn't we didn't get talk about breaks too much, but I think that again that's another thing that can help kids um, or or get in the way. So certain kids might need a break. Um, if you had taken me away from my test and given me a break, it would have taken me another half an hour to get back on track. Um, so so much of what we found was that students are the experts and. Um, and we need to talk to them about what's going on. Um, and that is my long spiel. Um, Kasinda, I'm gonna turn it over to you and, um, and take a little bit of a pause if folks have questions. All right, thanks Virginia. So uh, next we're gonna look at some suggested strategies and considerations. Um, and NCEO has developed a few short videos and the first one we'll take a look at is a student, a special education teacher talking about the use of a read aloud accommodation on a, on a state math test. So Emma, let's talk about your accommodation for a moment. You know how I read your math quizzes aloud? Uh-huh. Well, we can use the same accommodation on other tests as well. Have you heard Ms. Coleman talk about the state test in math class? You mean the big test? Yeah, we talk about it a lot. Well, you can use your accommodation on the state test, on the big test, in the same way as you use it on your math quizzes. Let's think about it this way. When I read the test questions aloud on your math quiz, how does it help you? I'm not sure. I guess I don't spend as much time reading the question, and I spend more time thinking about the math. Great. Well, on the big test, your accommodation might work the same way. You can focus on the math rather than focusing on reading the question. What do you think about that? Okay. So, so first, one of the strategies that can be used is talking about students about their accessibility and accommodations. In the brief, if you reference the brief, there are actual questions that you're welcome to use or to um, change to, to suit your needs. But it's important to learn more about their perspectives from the classroom experience so that you can address any accessibility needs that they may um, be struggling with so they have the opportunity to practice and so that they're well prepared to use that accommodation on the statewide testing. Um, you could talk about some other suggestions would be talking about strength and weaknesses, um, you know, talking with the students about their performance. How did they feel versus what the actual data shows? Um, did they feel comfortable? Did they feel like they knew how to operate the, accept the accommodations? Next slide, please. Another strategy would be to involve them in the decision-making process. So part of the IEP team, um, either participating or if they're not comfortable quite yet in their self-advocacy skills, that information could always be collected ahead of time and shared with the IEP team. But uh, one strategy that is important is making sure that students know the accommodation vocabulary. So they speak it and they can also understand that when they're being asked questions. Um, and it's important that conversations with students about their accommodations take place in their preferred communication methods. And if um, students need that takes longer than maybe doing some preparation before the IEP team meeting so they're prepared with the questions, 
have thought those through and are really able to meaningfully participate in the decision-making process. Um, so those were just a few suggestions. Next slide. Uh, another strategy would be to prepare students to advocate for their accessibility needs and preferences. And um, not only in terms of in instruction and accommodations, but how are these advocacy skills and the use of accommodations going to help them as they transition into um, college or careers? Practicing um, for the IEP teams, role playing, making sure that they do understand that vocabulary. And then finally, another strategy is after the assessment is have another conversation with the students to find out how that testing experience was. And again, if you look at the brief, we've provided some specific um, examples that you can use or uh, change to suit your needs. So the next video we're going to share is a the teacher having a follow-up conversation with the student about their read aloud experience on state testing. So let's talk about testing last week. I spoke with Mr. Torres and he said it went really well. How do you think it went? Good, Mr. Torres is nice. Did listening to Mr. Torres read the items aloud help you understand the math questions better? It helped me to think hard about the test and not have to keep reading the questions over and over. Do you mean that it took you a long time to think about how to solve the problem rather than taking a long time to read the question? Yeah. Okay. And then Mr. Torres also said that you were very interested in the science experiment set up in the room for later in the afternoon. It was so awesome. You should have seen the pulleys and levers. Really? There was this, I tried to keep just looking at my paper and not think about them, but you should have seen them. There was this huge pulley that was set up that looked like it was gonna lift a basket of money. Okay. I didn't see any dimes. So it sounds like it was a little difficult to stay focused on the test. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Emma. This has been really helpful. Let's go back to the group. Okay. I really like that video, Cassinda. That one always it reminds me of me. <laughs> well, what's nice, too, is they're, um, it's not just the special educator talking with the student. She's also ta uh, brought into the conversa conversation some observations and feedback that the general educator um, provided. So that was part of the conversation. I really felt like um, I would have been distracted in that other classroom too. Um, it's a good, th so this set, if you follow the, the link, there are a set of these videos that all kind of go together um, that are on our YouTube page that you can use. Um, with families, with teachers, you can use these for professional development. Um, they're nice and short and quick. And um, I find that um, they're pretty, they seem pretty real to me. And I, I feel like I recognize um, myself in this young lady sometimes. So uh, go check those out. And so then, oh, so now you we've talked about the research and some of the suggestions. Um, we just want to talk a little about some of the implications for practice. So the first is just that student accommodations should be individualized to the student. So it's not a one size fits all for any accommodations and disabilities. Um, it really depends student to student as they have different unique needs as well as different strengths and assets that should be considered when making accommodation decisions. Um, as you've probably gotten the point across this whole thing, we think that student perceptions should be considered in the decision-making process. The students know themselves better than anyone else and how they experience the accommodation in the context of their school setting is important to consider. Um, as Cassinda mentioned, also students are learning self-advocacy skills when they are sharing their perceptions. Um, they're able to help build self-determination, self-advocacy skills, which they need to prepare um, for post-secondary life. Students should also have the opportunity to try a variety of accommodations. So if there are multiple accommodations that intend to meet the same need, it's great if students can 
try them out and find what they're most comfortable with and then provide that feedback so that that is taken into account during the decision making. Finally, it is just important to measure the effectiveness of the different accommodations, um, seeing how the accommodations are supporting students' performance and taking that into consideration. So we're finishing up with just some considerations for two different groups of students. Uh, first, students with complex disabilities, specifically thinking about complex communication needs. And then we'll be looking at English learners with disabilities. Uh, so one of the big things for considering for students with complex communication needs um, is that they're going to need to learn the vocabulary to talk about their experiences with accommodations. So it's important to figure out for each individual student what language they can best use to share what works and what doesn't work for them, to talk about the accommodations they're using and just giving them the language so that they can communicate this. They also, it's important to give practice um, during instruction so that a student will become familiar with the language and be able to advocate for themselves when it comes time to uh, take the assessment and advocate for assessment accommodations. I just would like to add that um, at an IEP meeting and you you really want the student to participate and they have complex communication needs, build in the time so that they're not rushed and they really, again, can mean, meaningfully participate in the, the IEP team decision-making. Thank you, so much. Um, so I think that addition of the word meaningfully participate. Um, thanks, Cassinda. Sorry, Mari, you keep going. Okay. Uh, we're finishing with some considerations for English learners with disabilities. And we'd like to thank Andrew Bennett from the Idaho Department of Education for his expertise on multilingual learners and his contributions to the content of these slides. So English learners have unique cultural and linguistic needs that need to be considered when we're selecting accessibility features and accommodations. Uh, interaction and intersectionality of being both an English learner and having a disability may impact which accessibility features and accommodations are most appropriate and most effective for students. And it's important to remember also that students are coming in with a wealth of knowledge and strengths that should be capitalized on uh, when making decisions about accessibility features and accommodations. It's also important to think about the IEP team and be really intentional when thinking about the composition of the IEP team. So it's important to include English learner educators as IEP team members and think about anyone else who should maybe be included there if translators are needed or additional supports. IEP teams should also understand and promote um, the values and assets that students are bringing um, and should take into consideration the perceived appropriateness of accessibility features or accommodations. So um, different students might have different values and beliefs about disability and about accommodations. And it's important to take those into consideration to make sure that the appropriate accommodations are selected. And finally, it's just important to make sure that Educators are able to support the English learners in the way that they need to. They sh should receive explicit training on both instructional and assessment accessibility features and accommodations. And they should really prioritize picking accessibility features and accommodations that are transferable between instructional and assessment settings so that the students are able to have that continuity with what they use in the classroom to use on assessments. An educator should recognize that the identified accessibility features and accommodations for language hold equal weight as those for disabilities. So students might be receiving supports for language needs and for disability needs, and these are equally important. Like, Mari, I like how you, and I think I missed, I missed saying this earlier, but looking at things as asset-based rather than deficit-based. What skills do the students come with that we can utilize and build upon rather than looking at it as deficit-based? Another, con another consideration, again, you may need to 
schedule the applicable time if more time is needed to consider language and cultural considerations. But also if the student support system, do they, do they need information ahead of time so that they have the opportunity to read that and digest it and ask questions because it could be our, it could be very, this could all be so unfamiliar. Um, so we want to make sure that the student support folks at home um, have the same information as well as the students getting it at school. Well, we're going to stop here for questions before we go into our activity.